Welcome back to Autism Live. So thrilled that you guys are with us. We've got Bonnie Yates, special education attorney, joining us uh, via Skype. And Bonnie, welcome to the Autism Live 2019. We're so thrilled to have you back. Yeah. It's a yeah, exactly. Rainy Autism 2019. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. But thrilled to have you. Bonnie is joining us from Hirji and Chow, an, an amazing law firm here in, in Southern California. Bonnie, tell us a little bit about Hirji and Chow and how families can reach out to you. Hirji and Chow is a disability and special education based law firm in Culver City. You can Google us and look at our website, or you can call us at 310. 3910330. And I love the website, which is lawyer for the number four children.com. It's a great resource. It's fabulous. Uh, we really love here G and Chow, and we're thrilled that they allow you the, the time to be able to do this with us. And thank you for the time to be able to do this with us because Bonnie answers questions that we have that are of a legal nature. There's always a disclaimer that you give, Bonnie. Tell us what the disclaimer is. Uh, you are so right. Well, we're giving advice per California law and federal law. So if you live in another state or you have a specific legal question, we would refer you to COPA, C-O-P-A-A dot net. You can usually find a list of attorneys there that are recognized as doing special education in your state. We got lawyers now in all the 50 states, which is a good thing. It's amazing. So, okay, so Shannon, yes. can I start out by doing a little bit of shameless um, adulation of Jenny Chow? Absolutely. So Jenny is, is one of the two partners at Here G and Chow, and in November or December, she did a hearing against Inland Regional Center on behalf of a 54-year-old man who'd been trying to get autism eligibility since he was in his 20s. So this is his third or fourth cycle through the system. And Jenny, uh, who had a fairly new baby at the time, tried the case and won. And I'm really excited about it because it has an exhaustive discussion about how, how autism manifests in an older person and how it's not going to look the same as in a child and that this client clearly had both autism and intellectual disability and the expert witness for the for the regional center who runs all their psychological assessments there was strongly criticized for a number of things he did and didn't do one of the things he did do was when he when he administered the I believe it was the ADOS, not the ADIR. He had the stepbrother of the client in the room with him and used him to prompt answers. He also used some other testing that was really not valid for the purpose he used it for, and it inflated all of his scores and directions that worked against the client. I believe I sent the decision to you, Shannon. I think it is such a great decision. I'm so proud of Jenny, and I think... Even if you don't know somebody that it'll help, maybe you'll meet somebody that it'll help. And, you know, one of the problems this client had, Regional Center used against him the fact that he was old. So he didn't have, they claimed he didn't have a diagnosis that originated before the age of 18. And they claimed that since most of his school records had been destroyed, we didn't have adequate proof that he was in special education. And then they claimed that he graduated with a high school diploma and they claimed that he was fine, and in fact his family's been carrying his case for him and running interference at his job for him for years, and so uh, justice was done. And what a landmark case, I mean, because clearly that's going to have a huge impact, not just in California, but that probably is going to reach further than that, because when families are looking for a way to say, you know, we want services for people who are older who didn't get the opportunity to get the services that we have available now, uh, and they shouldn't be shortchanged because of that, this gives people a chance to point to and say a decision has been made in this favor. Am I right, or am I reaching uh, too far? Well, um, okay, this was a 25-year fight on behalf of this family, 25 years. And the, where the judge started was she took the DSM-5 and she went through it. And for every aspect of the DSM-5 that was um, on all fours with the client's presentation, she bolded it. So that's a nice way to start is a judge's 
um, interpretation of what in the DSM-5 is important when looking at the characteristics of an older person with autism. Pegeen Cronin, uh, formerly of UCLA, uh, was our expert witness and did the assessment of him. She did a really nice job of doing all the collateral source information. Um, it was a happy day in the office. So I uh, wanted to mention that. I know we've got to talk you. about the teacher strike and a few other things. But, but thank you for telling that. To us, but No, thank you for telling us, Bonnie, because I think a lot of times we get bogged down in the you know, in the day-to-day, -day, the grind of, you know, understanding that everything isn't the way we want it to be and maybe it never will be. And when we hear things like this, we go, okay, even while we're sleeping or doing something else, there are good people fighting the good fight and making changes small and large that add up to things being better. So it's so inspirational. Thank you so much for sharing that. Well, Jenny did the heavy lifting, so... Anyway, well, please congratulate I, her on our behalf. I will, and I'll just say that I've had my eye on Inland Regional Center for a long time. I think because they've had historically um, a poor population, many of whom are not English speaking, I think that they get away with murder. After the shooting, which we all acknowledge was tragic and happened very close to the Regional Center, they used that as an excuse to shut down for six months. Wow. They just conducted no business, and I don't think that that was really fair. So anyway, we're, we're watching you in the Regional Center. There you go. Um, okay, let's talk about the teacher strike Yeah. quickly. Yeah. Because I'm not an expert in these matters. I'm told that what Butner is trying to do, Butner's the superintendent, is he's trying to break the teachers' union, and that he re was recruited by Eli Broad, who builds charter schools that are not unionized in California, to see whether he could, you know, push back against LUSD. I don't know if that's correct or not. That was told to me by a teacher in an IEP who was kind of a union leader. And he said that's what that's what Butner wants to do, is he wants to break the union. In terms of our position as an office with respect to our clients that are LUSD students, well, first of all, we were informed that all mediations were being canceled. So think about that, okay? We, we, as an office, decided to take the position that we support teachers, we support the strike. Uh, we felt that people should stay home if they possibly could, not that we're judging them, or that if they have to go to school, because, you know, people don't always have the freedom to stay home with their kids, that, you know, we were not judging them, but that we were getting reports about supervision being poor at school due yes. to the, you know, the limited amount of staff. And then... Um, to the extent that there were faith denials because of the failure to be able to attend school, our position is that's the district's fault, not the teacher's fault, and the teacher should have the right to strike. I have a kiddo that was supposed to start his you know, new uh, program of, of BMOD this week at school. He has a new agency coming in to provide the ABA, and he's at home. So yeah. he's not getting his services and that's very concerning to us so we're in between a rock and a hard place and that's our position on the strike and and for parents what uh, what i'm concerned about from you is what are our rights if so we our child has uh, an iep they're entitled to these services but in a lot of cases the surface services aren't there what right does a parent have i'd ask for combat I'd say my kid missed this much school. It wasn't their fault. It wasn't safe to go to school. You have to offer them comp ed. I don't think they're going to do it. I don't know how long the strike is going to last. The longer it lasts, the better case there is for comp ed. If it's only a week, what is comp ed? They have to pay you I'm money sorry. to get it someplace Compensatory else. Compensatory education. And and what does that mean? That there. It means that that you get makeup time for services you miss. Not always one to one correspondence, but you get some amount of makeup time to recoup the lost time that you didn't get that the district owed you. What a mess. What a total, mm -hmm. total mess. Because, yeah. we, you know, USA Today did an article and said that this is over 100,000 students in Los Angeles with special needs that are out because of the strike. And if they all have to have compensatory education when they come back from the strike, that's a lot of money. It is. It's all. It's 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 a lot of money, and I don't think the teachers' union did this lightly. But you know, let's face it: who wants to be on the front lines and take a bullet? You know, who wants to not be able to pay their bills and have to spend 
all kinds of supplementary money of your own to buy materials for your classroom. I mean, teachers need to be respected and supported and compensated appropriately. And California's 49th out of the 50 states in terms of spending on education. You know, it's not that we don't know what to do to make things better. We do know. Well, and so much of what my understanding is that what the teachers are striking for is for smaller class size, which it helps our kids, helps all kids. Exactly. And having a, a, t uh, a nurse full-time uh, in each location, which to have anything less is inexcusable. I know that the LAUSD says very loudly, we don't have enough money to do all these things that you're asking to do. But in um, it, I've seen, physically seen, the letter that they sent out to special education, or uh, not to special education, to substitute teachers, saying that during the strike, to pay people to cross the picket line, they were going to pay $42 an hour. $42 yeah. an hour. That's not, teachers don't make that. No, um, I think we can do whatever we want. And when I said it's not that we don't know what to do, I was thinking back to, you know, probably once 20 years ago, I went to Doreen Grampache. I was really upset about some IEP where they offered some eclectic program. And she looked at me, she goes, Bonnie, it's not that we don't know what to do. We have the information. We know what is needed, you know, and, and, and we know that wealthy people in the United States send their children to private schools where the classes are small and they get a good education. And I believe that education is something that should be available to any person who wants to take it seriously. And it shouldn't be determined by economics, and it is in this country. And I try not to be political in this program. And if we don't agree, I still respect you and am interested in your point of view, but I do believe that. Well, I, as a former educator, and I think once an educator, always an educator, I know that kids learn in lots of different ways. And I believe in the public school system and believe that we have to fund it. I also am a fan of charter schools. I, I have to, you know, admit that I am a fan of charter schools. But I think no matter where you're educating, if you, my biggest soapbox that I'm always on, if you do not appropriately take care of the educators, that means by giving them continuing education on things like how to deal with behavior issues, if you don't give them the right supports and the right tools, you're not doing your job. And, and what I have seen in the education system from the inside is that they, they talk about, well, we don't have enough money for the teachers, so we have to make the class size bigger um, and, and they never take away an admin or a secretary position. They only take away from the education side. And, and well, I, I would say at the college level, at least where my husband works, there's disproportionate pay for people in the sciences and people in administration. And there's, you know, apparently at the college level, the thought is that the people that we would hire to be things like, um, you know, university chancellor, or if we didn't hire these people, they would go to the private sector where they could make $650,000 a year. So that's what we have to pay them. Look, you you know, I'm not going to say any more about this. I want to, I have other stuff I want to talk about. I want to move on. But there's lots of things we could do to make things better. But I think we're, I think I'm in complete agreement and complete respect of your opinion. So Larry Mantle on KPCC, which I think is 89.3. Yep. had some interesting interviews yesterday with parents from charter schools and, you know, asked parents of special needs kids to call in. I haven't been able to listen to that yet, but that might be interesting for people to go back. And Absolutely. Listen to the archive I'll footage. take a look at that. Okay. Moving on. Moving on. Um, I wanted to talk about several things. Um, the first is we're involved in a dispute this week where the parent has given complete consent to implementation of the IEP. There is no issue for due process, and the district is insisting on continuing its um, due process filing. So I wanted to talk about whether or not the district can uh, file for due process hearing under circumstances where there is no disputed issue. So in other words, the district is basically doing this because they're mad at mom. Because mom wrote back and said, I agree to, elegi you know, to the um, eligibility, well, no, she disagrees about eligibility, I'm sorry, she said, I, I agree to the, you know, the services and the goals and the placement, and you can fully implement the IEP. However, you didn't offer adequate reading support, the OT 
European speech services you gave are too low and they're all in group format. I mean, she basically said, I, I agree to full implementation of the IEP. I don't concede that it's a FAPE and the district is filing against her. So I just want to tell people in California, you are allowed to consent with reservation and that's perfectly legal and the district shouldn't be able to file for due process against you under those circumstances. So they're basically trying to shut this mom down. It's not going to work, but, you know, they're testing the waters and they're going to end up paying attorney's fees. So I wanted to mention that. But, and yet the mom signed the IEP. She just signed it saying, I don't, I don't agree to this, this, and that. So they're making an example of her. Is that what's happening? I think, I think so. I think they're trying to push back because she's been pushing forward. She's insisting on seeing a particular program. They don't want to show it to her. Um, they don't like her kid because they think he's assaultive and they're paying for two-to-one behavior intervention. There are a lot of reasons that they're unhappy about the case, but the point is you're allowed to, to consent to implementation without conceding that it's a free, appropriate public education, and there's nothing to, there's nothing to litigate. The, the parent is given full consent to implement the IEP. So I, I wanted to mention that. Well, I, and then, I, to be honest, I mean, you know, People are always amazed when I say to them that our school district, our original school district, filed due process against us twice. I had not signed the IEP, so it's different in that respect. But people always say, don't you mean you filed due process against them? And, and no, I don't mean that. They filed due process against us twice, and I believe that it was to shut me down, shut me up, and make an example. Um, well, I completely agree. I think they had powers of future prediction and they understood you were going to become an important Southern California, you know, internet radio personality <laughs> advising thousands of parents. That was, that it, was didn't well <laughs> it didn't work out well for them. It didn't work out well for them because I talk if about a, it all the time. A, if a parent refuses to allow an assessment um, or if the parent refuses to, you know, to, I mean, you can actually say, I consent, but not to your speech therapy services. Everything else is good. That's fine, too. If the district feels under that kind of circumstance where you're refusing to allow them to implement too much of the IEP, then they can file for the right to implement more of it. But that is not the situation. Okay, so that's one thing. The other thing is there are these trees all over Culver City, and they're cutting them down because they have a fungus. But what I notice now is where the stumps of the trees are, the fungus is back. So what's the point? Okay, we've known for years and years and years that we're entitled under the Gaster versus Office of Administrative Hearings case that if they want to do a school observation, we're entitled to an equivalent opportunity. And after fighting with districts for years about this and getting to the point where I thought everybody kind of acknowledged that 30 minutes wasn't enough, now Manhattan Beach is starting again to write back and say on every observation request, 30 minutes. So, you know, I'm back to hacking at fungus. Um, uh. And the remedy for that is you file a motion to compel observation with the hearing office, which you can do whether or not you have a filed case. And um, is that really what they want to do? I mean, I was really just like so annoyed by this. I wrote the attorney a letter. I said, really? 2019? 30-minute <laughs> observation? Yeah. Anyway, after that, they, they, you know, they basically backed down on one case, but now they're doing it on all the others. So watch out for fungus that's underground and can pop out at any moment, you know, okay. that you thought you got rid of. All right. Um, we're, we have like four minutes left, yeah. right? Yes. Okay, I was going to rant for the remaining time about dyslexia. Okay. Because I'm, 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 I have a personal goal, which is that in 2019, we are going to get through the California dyslexia guidelines because I think they're really important. Mm -hmm. um, and we just keep getting involved in other things. Yes. So we had had a discussion to the extent that we talked about how dyslexic brains look different and there are signs that are apparent as soon as preschool and what those signs were and things like that. So if you have a person that has unremediated dyslexia, in high school or college, we're going to talk about what that looks like, okay? Okay. So appar apparently if you're that age, which would be 17 or 18, you may present with persistent reading or spelling difficulties. You may have very effortful, slow reading. 
you won't read for pleasure because it's not a pleasure, it's a chore. You'll have or may have difficulty taking notes in a lecture class. You'll probably use filler in your speech to give you time to process. So you might, you know, say like or you know or uh. That's all a compensatory strategy. Uh, you'll mispronounce things. You'll have difficulty remembering names and you'll confuse names. You'll have word retrieval problems. You'll have a smaller spoken word vocabulary than a um, listening vocabulary. You will think you're dumb. You may think that. You don't, I don't mean to say it's absolute, but you may think that you are not intelligent and teachers may have treated you as if you're not intelligent. You'll have difficulty on multiple choice tests. You'll have to spend way more time studying than your peers and it'll interfere with your social life. Reading may cause you extreme fatigue because of your inability to decode. You may have problems performing clerical tasks. Uh, you may have organization and time management problems and need extra time for review. You may need more guidance from your teacher to develop higher level concepts than other students. Now these students can also be gifted because their brains are wired differently. And I haven't looked at it, but there's something called the Creative, what is it, the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, which apparently, uh, as of 216, is a going thing. So um, it's not to say that you don't have other talents that can't be cultivated and exploited. Um, so you may have strong visual spatial awareness, 3D awareness, or strong auditory awareness that are potentially things that you've developed to compensate. You might have a higher technical or mechanical aptitude. And then Shaywitz in 2003, S-H-A-Y-W-I-T-Z, looked at the, the predominance of dyslexic people in law, medicine, writing, and science. Um, but there's a second part to this that's always really worried me, which is that as people get older and they have dyslexia, if it's not remediated properly, they will probably develop social and emotional problems. And, and, and we see that with teenagers. So they're anxious, they're depressed, they're, they have mental health problems two to five, five times more frequently than uh, people without dyslexia. Um, they have a pro problems with frustration tolerance and self-worth. They need to be you know, motivated and resilient in order to achieve academically and socially, and they're going to need psychosocial support as well as, you know, dyslexia support. A lot of these people have been told that they're lazy, uh, they have low self-esteem, and there have been studies about how low self-esteem actually frustrates uh, benefiting from intervention. Their parents may have the same profile because this is a genetic um, disability, and so the parents may be limited in their ability to help the child. Um, we know that they need a low-conflict environment and positive uh, teacher models, that that helps a lot. Um, and in terms of exclusionary factors, you don't want to say somebody's dyslexic if there might be other things that explain their presentation. So we look at whether they have a vision or hearing problem, a motor disability, intellectual disability, an emotional disturbance, or cultural factors. Um, so this is a big area. We're going to continue talking about it, but I think this is probably a good place to stop for today just because it's 11.16. There we go. But I think, I think you're right that the, this, uh, this information about dyslexia is really important. I think it's very informative and will help all of us as we move forward. So thank you, Bonnie. Tell us again how we get a hold of here, Jean Chow. You can call here, Jean Chow, at 310-391-0330. We'd love to hear from you guys. Okay, fabulous. Have a good thank day. And we'll Stay see dry. you next week, okay? Sounds good. Same time, same bat channel. All right. Okay, good.